Hey there, it's Dr. Jamie. Thank you for listening to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. I want to tell you a little bit about today's sponsor, Milan Laser Hair Removal. The holidays can be a stressful time, but there's a way that you can make it a little easier. Laser hair removal is the absolute best way to get rid of unwanted hair with permanent results. That means you can enjoy the holiday season without worrying about daily shaving, booking those time-consuming and costly wax appointments. I've done it myself before Mrs. America, and at Milan Laser Hair Removal, the average client is 95% hair-free within 7 to 10 sessions. Plus, they have an exclusive, unlimited package that's included with every purchase at no extra cost, so your hair-free results are guaranteed for life. That means there's no touch-up fees ever. The best part, it's totally safe. This podcast is all about using my medical expertise to help other people, and so that I love that Milan Laser was founded by a board-certified physician. Their providers are all medical professionals, and Milan Laser has over 140 locations nationwide because their hair removal is their sole focus. They're always in the hands of experts, superior medical oversight to achieve all your best results. So you guys, this holiday season, give yourself or a loved one the gift of smooth, hair-free skin and a future free of shaving and waxing. Go ahead and call Milan Laser at 833-NO-RAZOR or visit milanlaser.com. And guess what? You know I got you the hookup. You can use my code FITANDFAB60 to get 60% off any body area, including the full body purchase. You guys, that's Fit and Fab 60 all one word. Thank you, Milan. to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with Dr. Jamie Seaman. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Jamie. Welcome back to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Thanks to everybody that's been listening to all of our episodes, sharing them around the world. I think it's so incredible to look at our downloads, how many countries and cities we're in. It's it's just amazing the changes that you guys are helping uh, uh, instill across the world, talking about nutrition and lifestyle and, and all these other things. But I have the most amazing guest on today. Dr. Sean Baker is joining me on the Fit and Fabulous podcast. You guys, he's not just a doctor. He's an athlete. He's a dad. And he's a huge proponent of the carnivore diet and animal-based nutrition. Um, he got his Bachelor of uh, Arts at the University of Texas down in Austin back in the 1980s, became a doctor of medicine at Texas Tech, completed five years in orthopedic surgery at the University of Texas, went on to be the chief of orthopedics in the Air Force. So he has given a lot to our country. He spent time in the Bagram Air Base in Afghanistan, performing all kinds of surgeries uh, that I'm sure he could tell us about. Um, he served our country very well. And Dr. Baker, we, we appreciate that. But he's also a really strong human, you guys. He placed first place in the Texas Strongest Man Competition Class of 2004. He's a, just a total badass human. Dr. Baker, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast. Well, thanks, Jamie. I feel better today. I was feeling a little down, but after that intro, I've got, I'm, 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 I'm just kidding. Hey, that's <laughs> no, no, it's kind of, I got to tell you, it's sad to see Bagram getting turned over back to the, to the sort of the Taliban taking over. I can remember a lot of, a lot of, you know, memories in that place, some good, some bad, but it's, it's kind of, it's kind of interesting to see that, you know, it's kind of bringing that, that stuff up, but thanks for having me on. It's, it's a pleasure. And you know, you, you are someone that is obviously doing, setting the world on fire, uh, I guess as well with all the stuff you're doing. So I hope no one, you're not downplaying your own accomplishments, but uh, good for you for doing all the things you're doing as well. No way, but it takes the, it takes a lot of us. We're just, we're just one tiny little voice. And so um, you're no longer practicing as an orthopedic surgeon. Tell people what Sean Baker is doing now and the impact you're having. Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm still very much involved in health and, and I think, you know, I think the impact through lifestyle, that nutrition exercise ultimately is greater. I don't, I think we have a real, you know, kind of a dearth of that in the, in the healthcare system in general. It's just very hard to do that. As you know, I mean, it's, you know, your time is taken up by, uh, you know, b delivering babies and doing things that, that, you know, it's hard to do those things. And, and there's not really a lot of, uh, you know, financial incentive to do that for most physicians and, and most physicians, quite honestly, just don't have the knowledge there. So uh, having stepped away for this for now for quite a while, I, you know, sometimes I think about, do I miss operating in surgery? And, and, and there's certainly a, a degree to that. But uh, honestly, I, I think that 
the amount of difference that I'm able to make on a larger scale is, is, you know, many orders of magnitude larger than that. So I'm actually very, very happy with what I get to do. And so, you know, as to, as to what, what is it I do? And I still see, uh, you know, clients and, and, and talk to them one-on-one. I do that a little bit. I don't do that that much because I just don't have enough, as much time for that, but I spend quite about a bit of time, um, you know, on community, on, you know, do, trying to get research done on, uh, you know, just trying to try to, in general, bring a message out that, uh, number one, nutrition matters, lifestyle matters in a huge way. But just as importantly, what, you know, I think we've been misled about, you know, particularly around animal products being being somehow unhealthy for us. And I think there's the data for that is is, you know, very sparse at best. And, and unfortunately, it's been uh promoted uh, aggressively for about 40 or 50 years now. So I'm trying to basically kind of unbrainwash people. It takes a lot of work to do. And we're, yeah. I think we're doing that pretty well. So tell us how you ever got into the carnivore diet and into the space of, of really impacting people in nutrition. Yeah. I mean, well, I, I mean, I certainly never dislike meat. I mean, I'm a normal, I'm, I'm a normal human being, a normal guy. Most guys like steak and the manly you know, diet. I mean, it was, it is a manly diet. No, it's interestingly, there is there still tends to be a little bit higher percentage of males and females that adopt it. But I, uh, you know, when I was pressed so on 50, I'll be 55 here in, in about two months. And um, when I was, uh, oh, I don't know, 42-ish, you know, I'd been I'd been you know competing as an athlete for literally my whole life. I still compete. I mean, I'm still it's, it's something that'll probably always be part of me. And I was noticing, you know, pre-diabetes, metabolic syndrome, you know, on and on and on these things occurring despite all the training I was doing. And I was, you know, I wasn't slacking. So I decided to, um, you know, I I said, well, nutrition has to be part of this. And so I just started doing different, different diets. And the first thing I did was went low fat, high vegetable, lean protein. And, you know, to be truthful, I did lose weight doing that. And um, I was able to get leaner. Uh, However, I just felt like, I felt awful. I was, you know, in the, in the hospital, uh, the nurses were quick to point out, we, we much, much, much preferred the, uh, more uh, jovial return, Dr. Baker than the, the, the mean sort of a kind of asshole you <laughs> kind of became. Cause I was always, I was always hungry, you know, I was just tired and hungry and grouchy and all, you know, and you know, when you're always hungry, you're not in a good mood. So that didn't, that wasn't going to last. And so I just, I just kind of, you know, stumbled my way through different diets and started reading and started, you know, then, then actually purposely reading a lot about nutrition. And I, I read pretty voraciously. Um, finally, you know, when I just before I turn just before I turned 50, I went from keto, which I had been doing for about I don't know, two and a half years to actually trying this silly, crazy, stupid carnivore diet. And um, it, it, it just, you know, when I did it, I just was like, wow, this is really, really you know, very noticeable how good I feel doing this. And so I did for 30 days and then went back to kind of a more of a omnivorous type diet. And I immediately felt worse. And I said, well, I don't really like that. And so then I continued doing it. And then, and then it kind of, you know, I was on a little bit on social media before I got kicked you know, <laughs> on Twitter, before I got kicked off and had to, you know, slip my belt way back in, which is kind of another interesting story. But I, uh, so I, you know, we'd gotten, you know, several hundred people to do the diet and they all had really good results, which was kind of, which was contrary to what you would believe having been told that meat is bad for you and it's the root of all evil. And, you know, all of, all of a sudden you go from eating, you know, the average amount, which is about two ounces a day. This is what the average American eats as far as beef is concerned. So it's really a small amount to going from that to eating for me, three, four five pounds of meat a day. And I mean, literally nothing bad happened to me. I mean, in fact, everything just got better. And so I thought that was interesting. So we got, we got, we got about a hundred people to do it. We, we kind of took, we collected data on those people and, you know, pretty much everyone lost a lot of weight. Everyone lost size around their belly and pretty much everyone felt, you know, significantly better. I think the only objective thing we looked at was heart rate and everyone, everyone's resting heart rate went, went down because we didn't, we didn't have any money to do this study and then um you know i guess joe rogan got wind of me doing this stuff and so i was went on his podcast and then immediately i became enemy number one among every vegan on the planet i think or something like that so i've been kind of fighting that fight <laughs> ever since it's kind of, it's kind of goofy this that you know, war is still defend. happening i think <laughs> yeah yeah i mean it's kind of it's it's kind of been you know it's kind of interesting it's been uh 
supplanted by you know the, the, this whole pandemic sort of thing that we're going through right now. So it's kind of you know that's that just kind of muted that little dispute for a little bit, but it's still in the background. And unfortunately, I think I think you should be allowed uh, to eat whatever the heck you want, and you know if it makes you feel and perform better that's that's good and if you can find out what that is so that's you know that's you know so I, you know, like i said i did i did my 30 days felt great came off it didn't feel so bad didn't feel so good and then i went back to it and now i've been doing it essentially pretty strictly now for coming up on well next month will be five years for me so it's been it's been quite a while now i've in that time i've you know i've said well let me see if i can do this or that and added a few things here and there and, and i ultimately always end up taking them back out um, just because I find that they're either not beneficial or they're slightly negative. And, you know, I, when, when, after a period of time, it kind of adds up. And then I just like, well, I'm just going to go back to strict 100% carnivore because I feel better. And this, I just got over COVID. Just, 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 I, don't, I don't know if you know that. I had that, uh, I think, November 3rd. I was diagnosed with it. A whole family came down with it. Everybody tested, you know, positive for it. My son was tested several times to confirm that. And, you know, it, it was something that, you know, probably about three or four days, I felt kind of crappy. I stopped, I, I missed one day of working out, but then I've kind of just, you know, then I kind of just have been slow to ramp back up in intensity. And so now I'm ready to, ready to, you know, there, I don't know how you feel, but I feel like there's a, there's a, there's a certain physical um, level that I want to be at, or I just don't feel right. You know, for me, I can look at numbers in the gym and like, can I deadlift 500 pounds very easily? If I can't do that, then I don't feel like I, I deserve to be walking on the earth. I mean, it's kind of a goofy sentiment, but I mean, there's these, there's certain net metrics that I like, I like to hold myself to. And even though I'm getting older and older, those numbers really haven't changed for me. I still want to say that, you know, this is a minimum standard for myself. Now, it's going to vary for everybody else, but anyway, I know it's, we've gotten on a little bit of a tangent here. But yeah. I mean, okay. I was, I, uh, I think you should be hard to kill. I mean, that's the thing is like, I want to be physically strong because I want to be able to mm -hmm. defend myself, run up a flight of stairs right. to do a stat, you know, C-section, pull a baby out with forceps. Like there's reasons why I want to be physically capable, but then I just think of longevity, you know, especially for women, as we age, the stronger our bones are, the more muscle we have we have better metabolic health. So I think there's lots of reasons to eat meat and lift heavy things. That's what I always tell my followers. But, um, so I, I think you actually exposed me to the carnivore diet in 2018, 2019. I was watching Sean Baker and I'm like, Oh, these people are crazy. Like just eating meat. I was already eating ketogenic at the time. And, um, but I tried it just like you did for 30 days and I got real lean. Um, I actually got hungry though, because I don't think I was eating enough. I had like initially so much satiety that I, I don't think I was actually eating enough, but then I started to add plants back in, uh, the following month. And just like you, I didn't feel that great. Uh, but there were certain things that I could add back in. I didn't have any sort of autoimmune condition or any of these people in this, in this world where they're trying to like heal their, you know, celiacs or eczema or psoriasis or whatever it is. And so I think these days I eat what I call a carnivore ish diet. You know, I have some, you know, plants or nuts or seeds here and there, uh, just cause I, I just like it from a social perspective. It just gives me a little more leeway, but my diet's very heavy and, uh, mostly red meats, some wild caught salmon eggs and things like that. What is your diet look like? Give us like an idea in a 24 hour period, what, what, what you eat. Well, I mean, today it was two ribeyes. I mean, a few minutes ago, like I mentioned, we, you know, we had a delay. So I said, I'm just going to crush some, crush some ribeyes. But I would say that for me, um, 95% of my diet is, is kind of red meat. I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's a staple. I, I feel like I get my nutrition from that. And I, and honestly, I don't feel like I've eaten unless I've had a steak or something similar. I mean, it's just kind of weird. And at this point, you're kind of like, where's the real food at? Um, you know, I'll throw some seafood in there. I'll throw some dairy in there. Um, every once in a while, like, you know, like, like, like my family, particularly my, my better half, she is, she came from a vegetarian background. And when I first met her, you know, almost 10 years ago, and she has slowly transitioned, you know, with me. And now she is probably, she's probably 90 to 95% carnivore. I'd say 90% is probably more accurate. And dinner will typically look like uh, some sort of steak or roast or whatever I've cooked, maybe cooked up a tri-tip or smoked a brisket. And then to that, she'll cut up a bunch of different cheeses and then she'll throw some kind of fruit on the table. And it might be grapes, it might be apples or something like that. And so, I mean, you know, 
I'll usually eat the steaks and you know, I'll eat the, the, the cheese every once in a while. I'll grab a little piece of fruit, but that, you know, like I said, that's, that's something that, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's my nutrition is coming from meat for sure. And I feel, um, you know, absolutely. But like, like after this COVID stuff, I mean, I was like, I, I just want to eat. I, the weird thing is I, you know, my taste, it was meat did not, everything didn't taste that great for a while. So I was just kind of like trying to get food in it. and now right. it's come back. And now I'm like, I'm like, you know, just wanting to ferociously eat as many damn ribeye sticks I possibly can to kind of catch up to this stuff. But, uh, I mean, that's been, that's been it pretty well. I mean, you know, I've had uh, a few times where like, I've just eaten just junk, you know, like, 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 uh, like on my kid's birthday, I'll have a cake and I'll have a piece of piece of that or two. And it's been very, but one year I got as sick as could be. I mean, I was like literally barfing outside after eating it because I hadn't had stuff so long. And then I, then the other time I had something and, you know, I didn't feel that, feel all that, you know, bad. I was just one of those things, but I don't, I don't really like, I die. I used to be, I used to be, I used to have a huge, huge sweet tooth. I mean, I, I was one of those guys that's, you know, eat dessert first because you don't know how long you're going to live, you know, type of thing. Mm-hmm. And I would, you know, every meal would be finished with some sort of dessert. That was just, you know, dinner particularly. That was just the routine. And it was, you know, the sweeter, the better, you know, I mean, people were like eating one piece of something. Like, I can't believe you can eat that. It's so sweet, but I would just crush the whole thing. And so I went from that to, I could care less. I don't, I don't really want the stuff. I don't need the stuff which I think is a pretty powerful, um, you know, change in, in, the, in the, you know, how you feel. Cause I think, you know, food cravings and food addiction are a really, really tricky subject for a lot of people. I think a lot of people struggle with that immensely. And it's not to say that, you know, I never, ever get a craving for something, but I, you know, I'm better adapted at how to deal with those things, you know, either I'll either like, okay, I'll eat it which is most of the time not the case, or I'll just say, okay, what else can I do? And I mean, you know, if you look at, if you look at how our physiology works, you know, I, I know that like acute exercise is acutely anorexic. You know, if I got to sprint on my bike for, you know, do five, 10 second sprints all out, I'm not hungry for at least 45 minutes. I mean, it just blunts your appetite. And, and then, so if I'm like dealing with some sort of weird craving that's one way to do that and i talked to a lot of people about that i said have you know have a backup plan in mind or something else you can eat or load up on a bunch of like you know i don't know there's a there's a company you may know raw wolf's company element and they've got these little uh, electrolyte packs and you know they're flavored to different flavors and so i'll just throw that in a big old blender of ice you know and blend it up and it's like a sorbet i mean it's and it, it, it it really does a good job to to sort of damp down any kind of those types of things so i'm probably you know compared to where i was two years ago um i'm probably 97 percent as strict as i was two years ago but again i'm you know at, at a point there was a point where you know at the peak of my unhealthiest you know there was a point and and now i'm not near there and so i've got i think a little bit more wiggle room from the, the many, and this is what we see. I think I think most people, you know, Harvard University just published their study on a carnivore diet. And if you look at the the actual food intake, you can see that for the most part, probably 90 to 95 percent of the food was all coming from meat and eggs and fish and seafood and a little bit of dairy, depending on the person. And then and then most of those people were still including a small amount of nuts, a small amount of fruit, you know, some of them a small amount of vegetables, but it was, it was really a tiny amount. You know, if you look at it, you know, anyone would look at that diet and say, Oh my God, you're deficient in, you know, vitamin spinach and, you know, vitamin broccoli and, you know, all that type of stuff. And so, uh, but, but that's the reality of this, this situation is I think most people, like you said, you want to live your life. There's some degree of uh, social, um, uh, you know, just making it easy socially. I mean, you, you know, it, I find that, you know, eating most of my meals at home, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a far better cook than, than most of the restaurants I go to as far as like if I'm going to get a steak, particularly if I'm going to pay $70, $80 for a nice, big, thick yeah. steak. You know, and I know I can make three of those at home for the same price. And so it's kind of a, kind of a rare thing to, for me to go out that much. Now on vacation, we'll be in Florida next week. I am going to bring my little sous vide wand. And we're going to go to a little Airbnb. So I'll probably hit the grocery store and load up on a bunch of steaks. But we'll probably eat out a couple of times when we're there. And you're kind of at the mercy a little bit of the, you know, of the, of the restaurant to some degree. Yeah. So you have a background in powerlifting, strongman. So obviously you care about performance. You just said you love to go, you know, hit the weights hard in the gym. So 
Uh, do you think that a carnivore ketogenic diet is optimal for performance? Do you think addition of some carbs is helpful? Where do you, where do you fall there? Yeah, I think, it, yeah, well, I mean, I've certainly seen people do extremely well. I mean, in, 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 you know, in fact, I've seen, you know, I've got power lifters that are doing extremely well on, on, on basically a full, fully carnivorous diet. I've gotten professional, uh, you know, MMA fighters doing that. I mean, I've done, I've, I've had no problem training very intensely and with very, very heavy weights in the absence of carbohydrates. Now that's me and I've been adapted to it. I think there's a point where you can adapt to it. Now, uh, certainly I think there's a, there's room for carbohydrates for a lot of athletes. Um, you know, assuming there's no other health issues. Cause what a lot of times we see are these athletes that are in phenomenal shape physically, you look at them and they're actually performing pretty well, but then, when you when you further look at them, there are some of them are dealing with autoimmune issues. Some of them are dealing with gut issues. We see a lot of that. I see a lot of you know, uh, particularly female athletes. They, they they wreck their gut, and in those cases, you know, it's it's not necessarily that that, that the glucose molecule is bad for them, but it's kind of how do you how do you obtain that? What what's a what's a carbohydrate that's not going to cause these other issues, whether they're gut issues or autoimmune issues, and People can argue about what the cause is, but we, we, you know, we're clearly seeing, at least in my, you know, the circles that I often walk in is people that are on these healthy diets and they end up excluding these leafy green vegetables or whatever that's supposed to be healthy and their health gets better. And, you know, the only explanation for that is there's something in those things that it, it, it is acutely irritating for those people. And, you know, if it, if it means taking it out for a while, that's, that's fine. And, and uh, you know, some people find that, you know, like the classic thing people talk about, you know, they put some rice, white rice or sweet potatoes or a little bit of fruit or a little bit of honey. These are all, you know, these are all kind of natural whole foods, which makes more sense than, than the standard American ultra processed stuff. You know, I think when we, I think the processing, I think there's, you know, the way we're designed to absorb food is not by powders. You know, we we, we just humans are not in the wild, we would never eat powders. I mean, that goes like powdered sugar, powdered flour, even protein powders can be can be problematic in the way uh, they, their absorption characteristics are not what we're designed to do. I mean, we're supposed to have this digestive process, which is which is you know there's a temporal sequence. You know, there's a there's a, you know obviously there's distance in in between these things. There's incretin hormones are supposed to be stimulated in a certain you know sequence and those things can be just completely bypassed by these you know powders that, that, that we do so i mean those are the things that uh i think when you're looking at athletes i i have some that you know they want to be carnival for whatever reason i'm like okay well that's fine but you know you, it might require some period of, of figuring out what your what the minimum effective dose of carbohydrates that you need for a certain type of training session you know not every training session is going to be kind of balls to the walls all out killing it. And then in those sessions, you might find that I can do very well without anything. And then you might find out that I need 20 grams to, to, to hit that, that gear that I want to hit. And then sometimes that changes. Some people can find that that 20 grams now becomes 10 grams. And, and then sometimes it's not at all. And so I think it's up to the, up to the individual to experiment. I'm, you know, I'm certainly no, you know, my, my, as far as dogmatism goes, the only thing I'm dogmatic about is just doing, making sure you do what works best for you. And, you know, beyond yeah. that, uh, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to fight tooth and nail uh, to say that meat is a health food. I mean, I think there's, the, the, you know, that's that's that if you want to call me dogmatic about that. I mean, sure, because I've just seen too much real world experience, which is, I think is ultimately where the rubber meets the road. Rubber meets the road. But also there's there's quite a bit of data out in, in, the, in the scientific community which supports that as well, or at least doesn't support the uh, idea that red meat is somehow bad for us. Yeah, let's talk about that because I think some people will argue, well, any kind of whole food diet devoid of these processed flours and sugars and vegetable oils is ultimately going to be healthy. So then you essentially have this spectrum where you have carnivore on one side and vegan on one side and paleo and all these other types of diets somewhere in between. But red meat in particular seems to get a bad rap even when you're talking about whole foods. So can you tell people that are scared that red meat causes heart disease, red meat causes cancer, why these things are, are not true? Well, I mean, first of all, I mean, you know, if you wanted to really ass assess that hypothesis, you know, you wouldn't do it by, by, you know, looking at, like I mentioned, the standard American diet, 
which is two ounces of red meat a day and, and something like 50 57% of those calories are ultra processed, you know, refined grains, uh, oils, and, and some sort of sugar. Uh, that's not how you would, you would assess that diet. You know, and I, I think the, uh, so, I mean, let's, let's just say, you know, like I said, there's about six or seven, art, six or seven research articles looking at an actual carnivore diet now, including one that just came out from Harvard. Every one of those studies basically shows that, that that diet is very, very healthy. So, I mean, the default, the, the, the default assumption should be in absence of other data, the only scientific data we have shows it to be quite healthy. Now, um, you know, when we look at things like the 19 or sorry, the, the 2015 World Health Organization, you know, decree about red meat being a class two carcinogen and processed meat being class one carcinogen. I mean, when you look into that, how that was done, you know, you, you may be aware of Professor David Clorfield, who sat on that panel, he basically said, you know, they basically threw out any and all evidence that contradicted the the outcome that they wanted to see. It was not a consensus statement. In fact, there was a large dissenting group. Uh, many of them, many of the panelists had, you know, uh, ethical conflicts of interest in that they were vegetarian, vegan, or Seventh Day Adventist. They failed to disclose that on the data. Almost all of the um, uh, data that was used to make that proclamation was was basically epidemiologic data, which is not particularly um, rigorous. You know, the fact that you can ask somebody what they ate for the last year. You know, no one knows the answer to that. So, you know, you've got garbage data going in and then making inferences based on that. And then the only only other data they had was some really poorly performed rat studies. You know, and these mice were given or rats were given. They were bred to get cancer. They were given cancer promoting agents or diet included a lot of sugar in addition to a little bit of meat and they never developed cancer. They developed something that they thought might become cancerous down the road. And that's, that's not, that's not at all applicable to, to what humans are. And then if you look at, you know, su subsequent to, to that data coming out, um, you know, I mean, this has been a, this was a controversial study that came out in 2019, Nutrirex, where they put six studies in the annals of internal medicine, basically saying that, you know, looking at the breadth of all the data on red meat, and I, and I like to point out that, that Gordon Guyatt was a senior author on that study. For those who don't know, Gordon Guyatt uh, was actually the, the father of evidence-based medicine. I mean, he, he actually coined that term back in 1991 in a single author paper. So he's out of McMaster University in Canada. And I had the, the opportunity to interview Gordon. But he basically spent his entire year, I mean, his entire career assessing what is evidence and what is good evidence and how should we make decisions based on that. And he came up with the great classification and some other uh, you know, um, ways to evaluate the evidence. And, and basically the, the result of that, you know, that huge, huge 14, 14 scientists, multinational study looking at basically all the data on red meat, uh, you know, and, and ranking it based on, you know, level of hierarchy with, you know, randomized control trials being on top. He basically said that, look, there's no convincing evidence. The only evidence that would suggest that red meat causes heart disease, cancer, any other disease is at best very weak evidence. And so I think that's what we have. I mean, we just have weak evidence out there. You know, if you look at, say, for instance, much of the Asian data, you know, I got criticized epidemiology for what it's worth, but there is plenty of epidemiologic data um, showing that there's no relationship whatsoever to red meat and, and you know, colorectal cancer, which is what the major concern is uh, in Asia. And you, you might argue that meat is highly prized in Asia. You know, it's, it's you know, if you have access to, beef in particular, it's considered, wow, this is rich people food. This is really, really high-end food. Whereas in the United States, you know, it's, it's you know, McDonald's. And, you know, so you associate that with poor socioeconomic class. And, and the way we often eat that is, you know, you know, the typical McDonald's burger and what comes with it is a far cry from the food that comes perhaps the way they might eat beef in Asia, which might be in like a, you know, maybe a stir fry or with much, much of quote unquote, healthy vegetables. And so you have very different perception uh, about belief perception about what it is. And, and then the associations are basically non-existence you know, when it comes to red meat and cancer. And so, um, you know, Journal of American College of Cardiology 2020 came out with a large paper looking at saturated fat, which is often, you know, demonized uh, with regard to red meat. And that, that, that paper basically said, you know, saturated fat as found in whole, move, whole foods like beef, eggs, dairy, and chocolate, I think they use an example, do not have any associations with cardiovascular disease. You know, and probably much as, as maligned as saturated fat is probably the majority of the saturated fat that Americans get 
is probably coming again in processed type foods. And so, you know, because you'll often have, you know, the stuff on the shelves and it's got, you know, some sort of dairy product or egg, egg product look mixed in with that. And, you know, if we're eating, you know, if saturated fat as a proxy for a low quality diet, which a lot of these things are, you have to, you have to kind of consider for socioeconomic status and diet quality, you know, these markers tend to tend to run in, in, in patterns. And so what I eat as a, as a carnivore who is very much health conscious, I mean, I care about, I'm not, I'm not interested in a heart attack. I'm, you know, I'm, I take care of myself. I don't drink, I don't smoke. I don't, you know, I'm not sedentary. I, I do all those things. And the results have been, you know, largely, I think most people would, would argue that, uh, you know, I, I'm in a pretty healthy demographic uh, or, or cohort, you know, at, at, particularly at my age. Yeah, I think that's been one of my frustrations. My background was in nutrition prior to coming into medicine is that this epidemiology research and then every study lumps red meat and processed meats in the same category. Like it'll say, oh, da, 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 these people have this much heart disease or cancer when they consumed percent of calories from red meat and processed meats. It's like, okay, hot dogs and deli meat are not the same as a ribeye steak. And none of these studies are ever done in the context of ketosis or ketogenic diet. So they haven't excluded carbs, processed flours, vegetable oils, you know, all of these things. And there's just so much, so many politics involved and, and special interests. And that's the, uh, that's the real unfortunate part about the world that we live in right now. And COVID's highlighted yeah, got, a lot of that. It's, yeah, we've got, I mean, so many historical examples of, of you know, populations have eaten, you know, either, you know, almost a hundred percent meat or very, you know, very significant parts of the diet. And these people were clearly healthy. I mean, it's not even controversial to say that the, you know, the Northern rain burn, rain, reindeer herders up in, up in Scandinavia and Finland, you know, the Sami are, they outlive the, the rest of the population. I mean, their average, average age of death is 83. I mean, compared to the average person in Finland, where it's like 78 or something like that. So we've got a number of examples where that's that's shown to be the case. You know, but the problem is, again, you continue to conflate um, meat eating with junk food. And, and that's, you know, that's and often that's the case. I mean, it's just like saying, you know, people with high cholesterol are, you know, at risk for heart disease. And most of them are because most of them are sedentary. Most of them have high blood pressure and prediabetes and you know, uh, chronic underlying inflammation. And, and so that's, you know, it's, it's easy to make those assumptions, but you know, it's, it, it takes more work and more nuance to say, okay, wait a minute, let me see what all, everything is going on and do that assessment, which is, which is often not done as you know. Right. Right. Uh, so other carnivore doctors out there would promote the, uh, consumption of organ meats alongside muscle meats. Do you think that that's required on a carnivore diet or where do you where do you fall with nose to tail nutrition yeah i mean i think there's nothing wrong with it i mean i think and i think there's a lot of um you know i mean it's it's is it is it uh ec ecologically favorable to do so sure i mean you know like i said you know i mean if, if not it gets turned into dog food i mean it doesn't really go to waste quite honestly but you know, I think that uh, my observation since I've been doing this and people have been doing it for much longer than me have said, you know, we, we just haven't seen it being a, a necessity. Um, I can see where you can make the argument that, hey, you know, vitamin E's vitamin or sorry, liver is really high in vitamin A and there's some vitamin C in there. And it's really high in protein and iron and therefore it's like a super multivitamin. And that's certainly true. Um, but what I've seen is, you know, uh, you know, when I look at the global perspective, now there are individuals that will absolutely tell me that I feel so much better when I include, you know, X, Y, and Z organ meat in my diet. And I, I don't have no, I have no reason to doubt them. Um, one of the things I asked the Harvard researchers to do when they, when they were, because they asked my help to help sort of organize that study a little bit. I said, ask that question, just see what, you know, if, if there's a difference in outcome in organ meat consumption and, and the same thing with, uh, grain versus grass finished meat. And they did, they did ask that question. And if you read the write-up in the paper, as far as the metrics they tracked, you know, uh, deficiency status, um, you know, disease mitigation, subjective outcomes, they didn't see a difference between the two groups. And that's what I found. Um, it's not to say that individuals won't benefit from that. And I think everybody should at least try it and see, you know, like I said, I've, 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 I've probably eaten more 
organ meats and, and some of them very disgusting things quite honestly when it comes to eating like rams testicles and stuff like i mean i've tried all that stuff and i mean for me i haven't noticed a, an appreciable difference and, and in, honestly it's just not that palatable to me i mean i've tried my best to mush it up and disguise it but i'm always like this is just not something i would seek out normally uh the other thing people have to realize is you know you know in, if you're hunting those organs don't last very long. Those are things that, that are really hard to preserve, you know, in, in normal situations. And there's also not that much, you know, well, I mean, depending on the type of animal you're eating, if you're eating a, a really big animal, then you're going to have a relatively small percentage of, of organ meat to muscle meat. And then certainly, you know, my, you know, my supposition, I think there's plenty of evidence uh, anthropologically to support that is humans used to eat big, 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 big animals. It just made the most sense from a, from a, you know, a nutrition acquisition efficiency standpoint. And so we were eating these big mammoths and stuff like that. And you start to look at how much meat is there versus how much of the organs there and the organs don't tend to keep. And so um, it's probably likely that we, we had a relatively small amount. And the other thing is, you know, you look at a lot of people like to look at hunter gatherers, modern hunter gatherers. You have to realize these people are, are basically subsistence living. You know, they're, 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 they've been forced to the edges of, you know, all the good territory was taken away from them. So they're like living out in the scrub trying to scratch, scratch a living. And so they're going to eat every calorie they can get. Whereas when humans are in a, subs, you know, not in a subsistence, but rather in a surplus situation, it's very different. And the same thing we see with animals, you know, wild animals, when, when the pickings are slim, they're, you know, they're gnawing on the bones, but when it's, you know, feast time, they just, you know, they'll eat a little bit and then walk away. And, you know, so it's a, it's a very different situation there. But I, again, the short answer is, I don't think they're 100% necessary for everybody. I mean, there are some people that, that clearly benefit from them and should continue to do so. So, but it's up to you to do your own experiment with that. Yeah. So large ruminants, obviously, the, you and I eat a lot of those. What about chicken, pork? I mean, <laughs> what if somebody um, only um, wants I to mean, eat I think yeah, I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, just in case people don't know, pork is the number one eaten meat in the world. And the reason for that is because it's so popular in Asia and Asia has four and a half billion people there. So it's 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 clearly the, the, the meat of choice. And there's many people in Asia that go their whole lives probably with eating minimal to no beef or lamb or other ruminant meats. And so you can, I think you can certainly make the argument that you can, uh, you can do well on those types of things. Um, you know, chicken tends to be chicken, you know, for those who don't know, uh, back in 1975-ish, you know, U.S. consumption of beef peaked at about 130 pounds per person. It's that now down to about 95. So it's dropped about 40 percent since the last 50 years or so. And, and in that time, chicken has gone up, I think, 800 percent. I mean, I think we've, we've consumed so much more chicken. It's it's a very efficient protein to to grow. Um, it. I think is, you know, I don't think it provides quite the same nutritional benefit uh, of red meat for, for a number of reasons there. And there's certainly different nutritional differences when you look at the labels there. Um, I don't personally eat much chicken. I don't, you know, if it's available and, and, and that's what there is to eat, I'll eat it. But generally I won't go out of my way to eat it. Uh, but I mean, I think I've seen a lot of people included in the diet and, and, and do fine with it. And a lot of, you know, within the ketogenic community, a lot of people like the chicken, thighs because they tend to have a higher fat content but uh um i don't you know like i said there's some concern about omega-6 uh fatty acids you know accumulating in chicken because they're mono monogastrics rather than, than ruminant animals and they don't quite have the capacity so i think there i think the argument can be made and i think it's a reasonable argument that if a chicken is fed poorly from a dietary standpoint, it, the, the meat turns out quite a bit worse. Whereas, whereas a cow can kind of eat just about anything and still produce pretty high quality meat. So, there may be some. There may be something to that. I there's no studies on that on humans. You know, it's just again a lot of these things that people have their um, belief systems about. You're like, well, show me a study that supports that, and there's none that we've done. I mean, I've been looking for it. In fact, I I want to see a study that shows that grass fed beef has a superior human health outcome. I'd love to see that study, but it doesn't exist yet. In fact, the only studies done on that, Texas A&M University did a kind of a study looking at ground beef, grass-fed versus grain-fed, and the outcomes were essentially the same. In fact, the grain-fed was arguably slightly better, but it's, it's it's you know, the, the, the outcomes were some biomarkers, which I don't know that necessarily mean anything. But um, 
but yeah, there's uh, there, there's people that do. I mean, I mean, we have a lot of people. It's interesting. We have a lot of people doing this diet in India right now. And as you know, India and most of India beef is is prohibited due to the Hindu uh, faith. And so they're you know, they're making do with chicken and 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 it's mostly chicken and eggs. Some of them do have access to things like lamb and goat, which is part of the diet. But I've you know, I've seen some people make some significant improvements now. Um, and again, I'm not advocating everyone has to be strict carnivore to get to get good health. But I mean, if you're if you only have options, and and honestly, you know, with the prices going up, you know, a lot of people are looking at. Uh, uh, you know, a ribeye that used to be at Costco for 11 bucks a pound is now 18 bucks a pound or whatever it is. I mean, you're like, wow, it's getting really tough. I'm going to eat some pork. That's, you know, honestly, that's probably fine for, for most people. There may be some people that, that have struggled with it, but I mean, it's, it's still high quality protein uh, for, for the most part. Yeah. I think, you know, you have to eat what you can afford and depending on where you live in the world, you know, the availability of these things. I know there's some people that are like, uh, you know, grass fed everything and wild caught everything and pastured chicken eggs. And <laughs> that's cool. But I agree with you. I think, you know, if we did the studies, I think if we could just get people to stop eating added sugars and flowers and vegetable oils, uh, <laughs> you know, there, there may not be a clinical significance between, between grass fed beef and, and grain fed beef. What about dairy? How do you feel about that? I love dairy. I mean, dairy's great. It's delicious. You know, you know. I like cheese. <laughs> Have you ever had this? Uh, yeah, and that's cheese? A, oh my God. It's like fried up in a pan. What is it called? Bread cheese. Oh, fried like milk. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like you cook halloumi, it up. Like, just, oh my yeah. gosh. So yeah, good. Yeah, halloumi, I've had, yeah, it's good. I'll have that from time to time. Um, honestly, I feel better without it. I mean, that's just me being honest. Um, but I still include it in the diet some. And, and I think some people, uh, I've, I've gotten away from where I used to drink a gallon of milk a day, just about every day. When I remember when I was a kid, my dad would get mad because he'd come home and I'd already sucked down the gallon of milk. Um, and so I don't do that anymore. Um, and I, and I just found that, uh, well, I mean, well, for one, I, I find drinking calories, uh, is a problem for a lot of people. And it's very easy to, you know, per, and I think, you know, you see the thing with heavy cream, you know, a lot of people, they turn this, you know, I think, Calorie like does. I said, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, fat is an important part of the diet, you know, particularly when it, when it comes to meat, you know, meat has a certain amount of fat in there, and it's designed to be eaten together, and it provides pretty nice satiety. But once you start doing the, you know, you know, the, the concentrated fats, whether it's, you know, starting to some people gnawing on sticks of butter or taking a, you know, taking a, a cup of heavy cream and throwing some stevie in there and whipping it up and then eating that and then all of a sudden you've just plowed through, gosh, you know, 1600 calories or whatever that is. Um, is, is a problem for people. And I think that's one of those things that, you know, I, you know, I, you know, throwing a piece of cheese on, you know, with your steak, you know, as a few pieces, you know, that's probably fine. And, and that's, like I said, that's something I often do, but if I'm honest, um, when I want to feel my absolute best dairy is not part of that equation for me, but there's other people that do just great with it. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's probably some people that, you know, from a genetic perspective, you know, maybe don't, have a tolerance to uh, lactase enzyme or something underlying in the gut microbiome or yeah, whatever it is. But I just tell well, I mean, people. Yeah. I mean, like you and I, I mean, both of us are probably Northern European in, in our, in our ancestry. And this oh, yeah. is the place like that we're very was. percent Northern. Right. Right. Northern there, yeah, European. Yeah. right. I'm, I'm, I'm Germanic background. So, I mean, we probably were exposed to dairy for much of our sort of cultural upbringing, I suppose. But uh yeah, that's uh, that's that's another one that's interesting. And you know, like I said, I, I I try not to be too prescriptive to, to, to everybody, but I, it's one of those things where I come. If people are having trouble with certain things, I said, hey, try try cutting it out for a month and see how see how it goes for you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so this study that Dr. Baker keeps referring to, I actually pulled this because I end all my podcasts with something called the semen analysis, a new study that I think is interesting or topic or whatever, just a synopsis of what we're talking about. But if you guys want to go find this, it was just published November 2nd of 2021, and the title is Behavioral Characteristics and Self-Reported Health Status Among 2029 Adults Consuming a, quote, Carnivore Diet. And um this was published in Current Developments in Nutrition, and you can go find it. This was uh, performed by a social media survey. I've, I saw this circulating and, and really helped share it because I think that this is important that we start to 
make some headway in, in the research and, uh, you know, to really show the health benefits that we see. And so this study uh, was performed from March 30th to June 24th of 2020. And it was people who were consuming a carnivore diet for greater than or equal to six months. Um, and people were asked about their dietary intake patterns and, and other things, as well as their you know, satisfaction with the diet. The median age in this study, people were 44 years old, 67% were male. And uh, most of the people said that they got into the carnivore diet because of health reasons. And I think that that is uh, what I see too clinically is uh, they want to feel better. And so they start experimenting. That's how I got into this space. I started with ketogenic and then kind of went paleo and then ended up on a very carnivore-ish diet. Um, red meat consumption was reported by greater than 85% of the participants. So 10% reported consuming vegetables, fruits, uh, or grains on a monthly basis. Um, 37% denied any use of vitamin supplements. Um, the prevalence of any adverse symptoms was low, which is, I think, important, right? Is, you know, if what's, what's adherence, how can people adhere to this? Are they going to, you know, feel crappy? Then they're not going to do it. And so, uh, there were some people, you know, maybe muscle cramps, some mild GI distress, uh, but really that was it. There was a super high level of satisfaction in this survey. Um, but I think the most interesting thing is, you know, as a doctor, what are the clinical outcomes and in people who were able to report their lipids, LDL, cholesterol, and things like that, um, we saw that LDL uh, was markedly elevated, an average of 172 amongst these participants. HDL was 68, and triglycerides were 68, which this is considered kind of a type A cholesterol pattern. It's still an optimal pattern when we look at these cholesterol ratios. Um, and participants with diabetes reported a major benefit reduction in BMI and a reduction in hemoglobin A1C and a major reduction in the use of diabetes medication. So I think although this is, you know, uh, a small study, it's a, uh, just a survey. I think it's such a good starting point. And Dr. Baker has kind of brought that up. Tell us, tell us where we go from here with carnivore research. Cause I know you've been doing some fundraising, um, and things like that to perform these trials. What are we, what are we looking at in areas of research with the carnivore diet? Well, I mean, there's going to be other researchers that that they're going to do some things I'm aware of, you know, a few, a few of those out there. But from my standpoint, we want to do a, a relatively large controlled intervention trial. And so that as we take people that are in, you know, defined a certain way with certain medical conditions and then just run the intervention and, and just, you know, do six months of a carnivore diet and, and see what comes out and see and compare that to sort of the usual standard of care and see which comes out better. You know, hopefully will show what I think it does is that a carnivore diet is very effective at, at, at certain things. Um, so that's, you know, we're, we're, we're still raising money on that. We've got about $300,000 raised for this. We'd like to get to a million dollars, quite honestly, and we're going to be doing some things with regard to crowd equity funding that I think are going to, it's going to facilitate that, uh, you know, through our company uh, in the near future. And so that's something now I'm not a researcher. I'm not, a, I'm not going to design it. I'm not going to do the research, but we'll end up contracting that out to some professional, professional researchers that can do that appropriately, you know, back to, you know, the, David's study, you know, and again, he basically said, look, this study is is not the design to tell you if this diet is the best for you or if it's healthy or if it's, you know, if it's going to make you live longer. I mean, that's not the, the purpose of that study because there's a lot of people who will say, well, that's not, you know, the ideal study. And they're, and they're, and they're, it, they're probably, it will be many, many studies that, that have to be done before some people will be convinced, which is fine. But I mean, enough people are at least looking into this. And so I think what David did, what did was, and David and Belinda, I should be more accurate, Belinda Leonard's was a primary research, you know, getting it through an IRB, getting it off the ground, getting it published in a major journal is a, is a huge, is a huge step forward for, you know, this, this sort of research. And, you know, like I said, the plant-based people have been very aggressive about research, researching their stuff and they're very well funded and they've got, you know, you know, millions and millions of dollars at their disposal. I mean, some of that coming through the Admit just Health System and some of these other companies that want to see um, see their products on the shelves. So, I mean, it's it's something that uh, you know we'll continue to continue to plug along with and let the data show what it shows. I mean, I think the fact that you know, hey, cholesterol went up. You know, is that good or bad in this situation is debatable. But I mean, we're you know we're pretty transparent about what 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 we're seeing, and I think that's. You know, I think that's a fair comment that, you know, we're not trying to hide anything. And, um, 
you know, and again, the, the problems with that study was, you know, there was self-reported data, some of it, you know, the lab data obviously is, it's harder to, harder to sort of be subjective about that. And then the, uh, you know, there's a, one of the things that I thought was interesting is, you know, you, you mentioned that the average, uh, well, it was, it was six months or more, but the average person had been doing it for 14 months, which is, you know, over a year, which I think is, for one, is pretty interesting. But the longest person they had in there was, it was 337 months, I believe, which is like 28 years, which I think is pretty cool to see someone's been doing it for 28 years and is still, you know, they're still, they're still hanging in there. So it says something about sustainability because we often see, you know, and we see people saying, well, a ketogenic diet can be helpful to help you lose weight in the short term, but it's not sustainable. And and you and I know there's people been doing this stuff for gosh, five, 10, 15, 20 years or longer and doing just fine. And they keep saying it's not sustainable, which I think is, you know, kind of ludicrous. Yeah. It's, it's not sustainable because humans like cheap, readily available, convenient foods, which are full of sugars and flowers and vegetable oils. And uh, they're on every street corner and every drive through. And the reason that I love the carnivore diet is because especially for women and men are great. Men are like, oh, you just want me to eat steak. Fabulous. <laughs> but women in particular tend to under eat protein. Um, muscle is an organ of longevity. And so I think having kind of this carnivore framework in your diet really makes women prioritize that protein, these healthy fats. So important for women prior to conception, during pregnancy, postnatally breastfeeding, uh, it, it's the most nutrient dense food. So, you know, if you take that off the plate, these, you know, doctors that are promoting this plant-based diet, I just think it's going to push more people into the processed carbohydrate space, the, the more you continue to vilify red meat. So I, I think these studies are, are super important. So thank you for all your hard work in promoting that, Dr. Baker. Yeah, I, I mean, I can't imagine if you just eat a plate full of, you know, you know, leaves and, and then not expect to be just ravenously hungry, you know, six hours later. And this is where, you know, you see where they're in the they're in the freezer eating as much ice cream as they can possibly shove it in before anybody sees them. You know, it's kind of yeah. like, <laughs> yeah, that's the deal you get with that. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Baker, for your time and spreading the word about animal-based nutrition. Enjoy your vacation and we'll talk soon. Jamie, thank you very much. Have a great day.